Hello everyone. Today we go back over 200 years to look at a case from Germany. So sit back as we go to early 19th century Bavaria. Andreas Bichel was born in 1760 in the Bavarian region of Germany. He was a quiet, industrious man and he lived in a nice cottage with his wife. He had a reputation of being a quiet person who never went out drinking and spent most of the time with his wife. He lived in the small town of Regendorf and occasionally got into trouble for petty thieving. The things he stole never amounted to much. They were things like vegetables from his neighbour's garden. He worked in a local inn for three years, but he was dismissed after he was caught by the innkeeper trying to steal some hay from the innkeeper's barn. Andreas would not be put off by being released from his employment and having to support his wife, he came up with an ingenious way of making some money. Andreas decided to go into the business of fortune telling. He professed to be able to see people's fortunes through a special magic mirror. He obtained a magnifying glass and propped it up on a small wooden board. It was an ingenious device that he claimed could provide a mystical insight into people's futures. Fortune telling was quite popular during the early 19th century. Fortune tellers could often be seen at parties in some of the finest houses in Europe. It was seen as a thrilling form of entertainment in high society. There were plenty of individuals from the richest to the poorest who truly believed in the supernatural. Their desire to learn about their future meant a good career could be had from fortune telling and Andreas was determined to prosper from it. In the summer of 1806, a young lady named Barbara Resinger answered an advert for a job as a housemaid and came to Andreas' house to inquire about the position. When the young lady arrived, only Andreas was home as his wife was working in a neighbouring village. So he invited her in and spoke to her about the position. The conversation soon turned to his gift for fortune telling and the intrigued Barbara thinking it would be a bit of innocent fun, agreed to have her fortune told. Andreas explained the process was very strict. He told her that she would have to sit down facing the magic mirror placed on the adjacent table. To make sure she wouldn't touch the mirror and thus ruin the spell, he insisted that her hands be tied behind her back. She would also have to have her eyes covered with a blindfold. Barbara was more intrigued than suspicious so went along with the request. Andreas had no intention of predicting the young lady's future as he knew exactly what would happen to her. Once she was in position, he took a knife and plunged it repeatedly into her neck. Immediately he took off her dress to preserve it and took her body to a pit next to his woodshed where he buried it. He then returned to the house and cleaned the blood-soaked room with water and sprinkled sand and dust on it to hide the stains. When his wife returned, she noticed the very wet floor, but Andreas brushed this off by telling her that he had spilt some water. Andreas did not seem to change after his callous act. He did not panic, he had no obvious mood swings, and he just continued his daily routine. His wife did not suspect that anything suspicious had happened during her absence. During the Christmas holidays of 1806, Andreas had to go to the nearby village where his victim Barbara was from. Whilst there, he bumped into Barbara's father, who inquired about his daughter. Very coolly, Andreas explained that Barbara had got married and moved away. He told her father that he had sent him messages asking for her clothes to be sent so he could send them on to Barbara. Barbara's father said that he had not received any messages, but took Andreas back to his house, where Barbara's mother packed some of her daughter's clothes into a case for Andreas to take back to his home in Regendorf. Andreas profited from the clothes. He either sold the dresses, used the fabric to get a local tailor to make other garments, or just sold pieces of the dresses as fabric. 
It was a good business, and along with his fortune telling and his wife's work, he was living a comfortable life. Andreas decided that this could be a very lucrative business. Whenever he saw a well-dressed girl, he wanted to rob her and take her clothes. He tried to tempt other young ladies into his house to have their fortunes told. In December 1807, he invited a 21-year-old girl named Graeber, who had not heard from her fiancé for many months. Andreas promised that his mirror would discover if the young man was dead or alive. The innocent young lady said, well, if you don't tell anyone, I'll come and have my fortune told. Andreas told her that she must bring her most beautiful dress and some other garments. She promised to come and Andreas returned to his house and waited for her to arrive. But Gerber changed her mind and never turned up to have a fortune told by Andreas. He then tried to tempt two other young ladies, one named Juliana Dowek and the other Margaretha Hemberger, to come to his house to have their fortunes told. And as usual, he instructed them to bring their finest clothes. Both girls, intrigued, agreed to his request, but again he was left waiting in the house alone as both changed their mind and did not go to meet Andreas. The three young ladies were local and were saved partly due to their disbelief in fortune telling and partly due to their suspicion of Andreas. In early 1808, 21-year-old Catherine Seidel met Andreas and he explained to her the virtues of his mirror. Catherine was very curious and excited about the amazing device that would let her know what her future held. But she was a sensible girl from a close family and lived in a comfortable house and decided that she would not have her fortune told. Three months later, she found work and lodgings near Regendor and with no family members telling her that fortune telling was just a show, her curiosity of knowing her future got the better of her and she returned to see Andreas. He told her she must go home and return with her most beautiful clothes. Catherine, now quite excited, returned home and collected her very best garments and hurried back to Andreas's house. He then explained the process, so tied her hands together with a string and put a blindfold around her eyes. Still innocently wanting to know her future, Andreas stabbed her in the neck. For some reason, he then decided to cut up her body and carefully dissected it. He served her intestines to his pigs and buried the other body parts. He stored the very nice garments in his closet and burned the blood-stained clothes. He then cleaned his house so when his wife returned, she would not suspect anything. A short time later, Catherine's sister, named Wahlberger, went to Regendorf looking for her missing sibling and came across something rather suspicious in a local tailor's shop. The tailor was in the process of making a waistcoat and he was using a distinctive corded fabric that looked very familiar to Catherine's sister as it was the material and pattern that had come from a petticoat owned by Catherine that she had taken away with her when she left her family home. She asked where the material had come from and the tailor said that it had been supplied by the person who had ordered the garment, a gentleman named Andreas Bitchell. Catherine's sister went to the local police and explained about her sister's disappearance and the fabric found at the tailor's shop. The police thought that this was a little odd so went to Andreas's house to investigate. Andreas explained that the reason for Catherine's disappearance was that she had met a young man at his house and had run off with him. The story didn't impress the police. They searched the house and in a closet they found a collection of women's clothes, including some that had belonged to Catherine. The police were then reminded that two years previously, another girl named Barbara Raisinger had also disappeared in very similar circumstances. She had also gone to Andreas's house and had not been seen since. Witnesses came forward who confirmed that Andreas's wife had sold some clothing which Barbara's friends recognized as having belonged to the missing girl. The possession of which Mrs. Bitchell accounted for by saying 
that Barbara, having married a rich man in another part of the country, had no longer any need for peasant costumes. The police continued the search and started to think that they may find the bodies that went with the garments. A local bailiff said that whenever he passed the Bitchell's house, his dog would jump up at the woodshed. He was ordered to go with some local men and dig around the shed. Very quickly they came across various bones and a decomposing corpse. Above the shed, next to a lime pit, lay many logs and when these were cleared away, they discovered the upper part of another body. Further digging found the lower half, and the bailiff immediately ascertained that these were the bodies of the two missing young women. Andreas was questioned, but denied all knowledge of the bodies, and denied any wrongdoing against Barbara and Catherine. The denials continued. He was taken to see the bodies, which were pieced together as best as the authorities could do, but he still denied any involvement in the crime. Two days later, however, while in his prison cell, maybe because his guilt had become too much for him, he confessed to both murders. He said he was only driven to murder in order to get his hands on the fine clothes that his victims wore. When the police had all the evidence, which included the reports of the interrogation, witness statements, and the confession from Andreas, the file was sent to the Royal Appeal Court in Newburgh. After consideration, the court pronounced the verdict on February the 4th, 1809, which found the defendant guilty. Some say that Andreas may have killed many other women, but the exact number is unknown, and he was only convicted of two murders. He was executed by beheading on the 9th of June, 1809. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening to this sad and tragic case. As usual, feedback is always very much appreciated, and I will see you in the next brief case.